So, good morning, Memory. <laughs> morning. Hi, Crystal. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. On the contrary, the weather is shifting a bit, so yeah. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. So, I'm going to start yeah. us off by asking, us, asking you to introduce yourself um, along three areas, who you are, your personal, uh, your political, and of course, your professional. Okay, so I'm Emory Zondeka Chambwa. I identify myself as an African citizen born in Zimbabwe and married three kids, all boys. Hopefully they'll turn out to be feminist. I identify myself as an African, Pan-African feminist who uses a lot of intersectional approaches. Uh, the feminist uh, approach to analyzing. So if you were to ask me, what sort of um, glasses do I wear? So my, my glasses and my lens, I, it has to go, I screen things using that lens. So that's who I am. Um, and then I'm really privileged to be working with women and girls while my passion and also to be leading Africa's, one of Africa's oldest, as well as one of Africa's largest network of women's rights activists, feminists, um, amazing, amazing uh, network that I'm leading as the executive director of FEMNET, the African Women's Development and Communications Network. And this network is really, it was born out of um, African women who just wanted a space, wanted to be seen and who also wanted a voice so that's me great thank you so much and thank you so much for making time for for this today um we're going to be talking about the whole beijing process and where we are and femnet's role as well as you know the role of african women in the whole process um, I was very young when I just remember stories of women going to Beijing and it was almost sort of like these Beijing women and they would all have head wraps and there was like something about empowerment, but I was too young to really understand what was going on. Um, the conversation has sort of come back recently and I just wanted to give you a space to give a, take us through a history of Beijing, what it is, why is it important and why is it so important for the women of Africa? Mm -hmm. So the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, this is a, a United Nations binding um, declaration, which was born in 1995. So I usually ask people, um, how old are you? <laughs> no, and I know people are not comfortable with that. But like what you say, you, you just remember, I'm sure you were very young, when you heard about Beijing, but the fact that you were young and you heard that something was happening, for, for me, it's like, yes, Beijing really made an impact. So really how it started is that um, the Beijing conference was the was a world women's conference. It was the fourth conference um, and it was happening in China, in Beijing. So what usually happens with these global conferences, they rotate in terms of this year or after four years, they were happening every four years. So the first conference was in Montreal in Canada. The second one was in South America. The third one was actually coming to Africa. So that's when actually FemNet became active because what happened is with the third World Women's Conference coming to Africa, it was going to be Nairobi. And what happened is that African women realized that, wow, these conferences have been happening, but they have not been really engaged in part of um, this, uh, these processes. So a group of women got together because, because it was being hosted here in Nairobi and in Africa, it meant that we needed um, women's rights organizations to work with the government ministers. And by then we did have a lot of women in government. And this meant that working with the foreign affairs, and the different um, ministry departments, which actually organize um, these big conferences. It's a UN global conference. So women came together and said, you know what? We need to have an organization that can network and bring all the women together and come up with an African common position, but also ensure that women are 
speaking. Women are also aware of these processes that are happening and they are able to take what is discussed in these big global meetings to their national context and to their context. So that's how Femnet became, was founded. And it was founded um, here in Kenya, but also registered initially in Tanzania. And then it came back to have its secretariat here. So Femnet has been in existence for 30, 32 years. And this was just two years after the Nairobi World Women's Conference. And something significant happened um, 35 years ago here in Nairobi when the World, Third World Women's Conference happened. The outcome of it was a document which is called Nairobi Forward Looking. So it was such a powerful um, document, you know, with specific recommendations. This is what we want. We want to see more women in decision making positions. We want to see, uh, you know, the girl child recognized. So what meant is that from the Nairobi forward looking, uh, forward looking declaration, that was, we gave birth to Benjin. So four years later, there was going to be the fourth World Women's Conference, and this was now happening in Beijing. So when it came to Beijing, that's when it was so apparent, women were motivated. They now knew, okay, there's a UN World Conference. This is what it means. It means that there are people who negotiate positions. Those positions and the declaration, whatever comes out of that, what they, what, what they have, um, agreed on. That is what the governments who are signed on to UN are supposed to implement and adopt. So when African women were thinking of Beijing, they knew this is a space where they can come together um, and make demands that they want their governments who are signatory to the UN to implement. So they were so clear and they galvanized, they mobilized, you know, when it came to Beijing, the, the participation was, I don't like using the word grassroots, but it was from community level. So you had women from community level. And most of the women were actually women who were involved in political structures. And this was also happening at a time where in Africa, most of the countries have actually had independence um, from 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 the colonial governments. So women were actually coming up and a lot of women had managed to get um, educated, tertiary education. So they also realized that they had the right to be in those political spaces. So they were fired up, fired up. When I say fired up, I remember, what I remember about Beijing is women who came back from Beijing were all being labeled, you know, they were labeled, all oh, these Beijing women, um, they are, they are governed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and what was really interesting though was, um, the, because there was a lot around the shifting of gender roles mm -hmm. and one narrative which was, you know what patriarchy does, it, it starts stereotyping and you know, gives a certain narrative to things. And they'll say, oh, the Beijing women, they want men to wash nappies, to do all these roles. And it was like, how can we have women who want men to do such things? You know, mm -hmm. these women are just not supposed to, to exist. You know, they are being radical. They are being, and it was, it wasn't being influenced by the West, like what most people think. Mm -hmm. But these were the women themselves, and it was at all levels across. So there was quite a lot actually um, that happened with the Beijing conference. Um, from Africa, one of the things that African women really pushed for was issues around um, economic rights, like ending poverty. That was really on the agenda. Um, issues of um, the girl child, actually coining the term girl child actually came from the African movement. And they were saying, we need to recognize that the girl child, you know, we need to have specific provisions um, for, for her education and for everything that the girl child represents. So out of the Beijing, um, in the declaration, there are 12 critical areas of action. 
Yeah, but maybe I can stop now. Um, uh, oh, actually, let's, I... let's, let's go to the 12 critical areas and see um, what they are and then, then fast forward to, to present day and what's happening um, with what they're calling generation equality. But let's, let's go to where you started and talk about the 12 critical areas. Um, and what's been okay. happening ever since to get us to this point where we, we're experiencing generation equality. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, so, so out of Beijing, where they agreed on 12 critical areas for action. So one of the things that is so unique about Beijing is they call it platform for action. So it was just, it was about action to say, what are the things that we need action on? And the 12 critical areas, um, women in power and decision making, the girl child that I mentioned, women in the economy, uh, women um, ending violence against women and girls, human rights of women, education, training of women, and women in the environment as well, I mentioned it again, women and health, uh, women in the media, women in armed conflict, and institutional mechanisms for advancing women. So I really like the institutional mechanisms for advancing women because that when you go through that declaration, it says women cannot advance unless institutions have transformed, unless there is um, you know, ministries, and that is when ministries of gender or women affairs it depends with the different countries. Mm -hmm. So one of the things they said, we need to have mechanisms so that from the government level, there are mechanisms that are solely looking on ending all the issues around women's access to education, removing some of the laws. I know, you know, even issues around double taxation on women. So there were a lot of issues which were called critical issues. I know. Right now, there are certain things that we are just unimaginable. I mean, just even prioritization of girls uh, in a family getting an education. Mm -hmm. That was something where if resources, um, when families made a decision on who goes to school, the first decision was let the boy go because this girl is going to be married. So what is the whole point of getting a girl educated? But, you know, with the women pushing and around Beijing, it was pushing to say we need universal education. Everyone should have a right to education. So, you know, there are things where you, you they are just unimaginable, but those are the things, even voting, women going to vote, um, ensuring that right now issues are around violence against women, 25 years ago, it was recognized already to say we need accountability on ending violence against women in the private space, when you talk of domestic violence, in the public space, um, everywhere, you know, really ending violence against women, issues around the environment. Now we are talking of climate justice, climate change. But already with the Beijing, they were clear, clear to say we need women to be recognized their contribution in terms of um, the overall economy to make sure that their labor is, is not, you know, there's not so much labor that women have to go through investment in labor, saving technologies. So all that was included um, in the Beijing. And now we are talking 25 years later. But for me, I'm always saying we should always always even talk about 35 years later mm. when the African, you know, African women's movement was on fire. You know, mm. we, when people came back from Beijing, they were vying for presidential um, positions because they were saying, there's nothing that stops me as a woman to be a president. You know, they were going into political parties, understanding how the structures work and saying, you know, we need to be present mm. we need all these mechanisms they were requesting um ministers of finance to set up women's fund i know there's a lot of critique around women's fund but then they were i mean that was non-existence before you know mm. it was not even seen as something that had to be there so when women came back from beijing they were not taking any nonsense at all mm. you know they were saying this is our moment we have to push and the beauty about it is there was a lot of collaboration in terms of the agenda was, um, nothing was dividing this movement. It was like, 
we these are the basic things that we need to really shift and you know it was a wave that really came on on the patriarchs who so, were not aware <laughs> yeah so 25 years yeah. later and sometimes working in the space working on issues to do with women's rights um on the continent it feels like progress is so so slow almost non-existent sometimes um the yeah. 12 critical areas are still critical areas and sometimes it's hard to imagine that there's progress but what you seem to be saying, and I think this is an important thing that we must look at our history and take stock of, of where we've come from and also celebrate our wins. There has been movement, there's been changes, yeah. even though they're you know, gradual and slow, there has been movement in, in terms of progress, in terms of moving forward for the women and girls of Africa. And I just want to celebrate that, that you know, it's not always so dire. Of course, there's so much more work that needs to be done. The 12 critical areas are still critical areas, especially now yeah. as, as the world goes through this pandemic and the crisis that we're going through um, more than ever. These are issues that really need to be at the forefront. So I'll take us now, I'll fast forward to current day in the last year, and I know there's been a lot of, you know, conversations about Beijing Plus 25 and what that means, um, which formulated mm -hmm. um, the the generation equality. And I just want you to take us through what the generation equality is and what role did the African women have uh, towards formulating uh, what it currently looks like. Okay, so 25 years later, on one of the things that um, African women have realized is that we need to sort of hand over, to hand over the baton to the new generation. Because like you said, you were very, very young, but now this is when you are in your prime, your voice, you know, you say a lot of things that make amazing, amazing, which shift a lot of um, uh, policies and things like that. So we need you, we need your generation to be holding um, the, the Beijing flame and really moving with it. So this is how the generation equality came about to say UN women, um, being led by UN women, it brought together civil society organizations and then it approached uh, two governments, uh, the government of France and the government of Mexico to support uh, what we are calling the Generation Equality Forum. Okay. So 25 years later, one of the things that the women, women have realized across within what we call the women's movement is that because of the amount of, um, the amount of momentum that Beijing had 25 years later, it was important to actually ride on that momentum and start galvanizing support, but most importantly, uh, doing a button handover to sort of like hand over to the new generation. Like you said, um, Crystal, at the beginning, we're very, very young. So this is about creating space also for the generation now, the now generation, not the generation to come, but the young women, the women who, women like Q Crystal, who are on fire, who are energized, who are shifting policies, dismantling, detonating, patriarchy, challenging. So this was the whole idea to launch what is called a campaign, which is called Generation Equality, to say we need a whole young women's movement to really carry on the flame of Beijing. And why? Because we've realized that there's been a lot of backlash. So 25 years, women have been influencing constitutions, putting policies, but we have realized that most of those policies are not implemented at all. There's no political will to implement that. We've realized that there hasn't been uh, financial support for, for making sure that, you know, the rights of women are realized, you know, in terms of even investing in ending violence against women, for example, um, reducing the amount of work that women have to do, uh, you know, issues like just availability of uh, sanitary, sanitary mm -hmm. mental health, just investing even in water to be accessible by everyone. So just those basic, the basic human rights, so we've seen uh, a lot of backlash, you know, in, even in terms of implementation, particularly of the policies. You know, that just make women equal citizens. It's nothing about women taking the place of men mm. or women 
trying to, you know, to adopt a foreign way of living. No, it's just so simple for women to claim their rights and their space. So the Generation Equality Forum is a forum where you, which is led by UN women and civil society. And the government of France and the government of Mexico have come in to support. So African women are also part of what the civil society, um, it has a civil society platform where we have different representatives of civil society in all their diversity. So networks, these are global networks. So Africa is also there. We have about three members, uh, one representing young women and they are from Cameroon. We also have another Francophone. Um, that's, I think I can mention Zone her organizations yeah. with change Cameroon. And we also have Elsie from Will Duff, uh, Francophone Africa, and we also have Femnet. So we are part of what is called in the civil society advisory group to the core group. So the core group has a representative of uh, UN women. It has a representative of government of France, uh, Mexico, and also uh, a civil society. And most recently, it also has a youth representative. So mm -hmm. there's a also uh, along this whole process, what is called the youth task force. So it's a task force of youth networks. And from Kenya, we have an amazing, amazing young lady from the Green Movement, who's also uh, among other young people who are part of the youth task force. So this is how the generation equality uh, is structured. It is a core group. It is a civil society advisory group. Then it's got a larger civil society group where any civil society organization, any activist can be part of it. So what is going to happen is that each of these, um, the core group has come up with what are called action coalitions. Remember, when you talk of Beijing, we are talking action, which is one thing I like about Beijing. It's just not about speaking, but it's about what action, what specific action mm -hmm. are you going to take? So out of this campaign, the Generation Equality um, Generation Equality campaign, they have what they call action coalitions. So these are coalitions of, there are currently six action coalitions. And are they are taken co from the critical areas uh, from the original yes. Beijing and collapsed into six? Is that what it is? Yes, yes. So there was a whole process uh, last year, 2019, to say, what are the six critical areas? So remember, we have the 12 critical areas. But looking at our context today, what are the six areas that we can say for the next five years, for the next 10 years, why don't we have investment in this? Why don't we come up with concrete, ambitious actions that we know can address, um, you know, when you talk of systemic, uh, structural issues, gender equalities, change social norms, change perceptions, change those things that really are at the core of making sure issues, um, you know, there's perpetuation of mm. gender inequality. So memory, I yeah. also asked you because um, you're talking about action and, and Beijing being different in that it, it, it works on action, actionable things that can be, that can be you know, done. Um, and for, mm -hmm. for the women's movement in Africa and to make sure that, you know, African women are living lives of happiness and dignity, at least for me, that's, that's what I go for. Um, mm -hmm. There's been this a perpetual way to to work on women's rights issues, like very tar targeting very individualistic um, issues. So microfinance, financial inclusion, things that target interventions that address an individual situation. However, we've seen very little, and you've spoken a little bit about it in terms of systemic change. Mm -hmm. Things that would systemically change the way things are done that would have bigger impact and, and really shift the way things are done. Um, and this, is, this comes through policy, through legislation. Um, it's very easy to work on individual initiatives, you know, 50 mm -hmm. projects, beadwork projects, and things like that. It's a lot harder mm -hmm. to look at systemic issues within our policy making. And how does Beijing fit mm -hmm. into that? And how is Femnet um, being in those spaces of influence ensuring that we're not going back into this handout sort of intervention um, type of, of development? Yeah, so 
Yeah, thanks, Crystal. I think what you say is very, very critical to say. Um, I think there's that shift from always framing women as vulnerable. You know, in, in some cases, women are even framed in the same light as children uh, who are powerless, uh, who have no rights and things like that. And you find some of the solutions and some of the interventions are just targeted on micro, you know, when it comes to women's economic empowerment. The whole narrative is say that women need to have micro enterprises, uh, women need to have um, micro businesses, get micro finance. Um, it even goes on to say, um, micro, micro of micro, so our Basharas, our mama bogas that is yes we find a lot of women are still at that level but the framing around just viewing women as being you know in, in that in that state and also not understanding that there is what we call an intersectional lens that we are not homogeneous at all so women because of different histories because of location because of age they are affected differently. So one of the things that what the ben the Benjin um, declaration actually did was to be able to already see that you know you cannot program or you 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 should not just address issues for women in the same light. Mm -hmm. You know, saying yes when you talk of women's empowerment, this is what this is this is their portion. Women in decision making, um, you know. Uh, they have to fight, uh, they have to be, you know, there's this whole notion of saying, um, why should women have affirmative action or quotas? Actually, quotas and affirmative action came out of Beijing. Mm. And it was, it, it's a process. It's just like, I come from a background where we had, you know, it's been 40 years since independence. So sometimes you see some of the, the backlash of colonialism. But soon after independence, um, what happened is, there was a whole affirmative action of getting um, black people to be able to go into parliament in all those areas. So affirmative action didn't just start with getting women into positions, into universities um, and things like that, but it also, it's addressing a system that has been adjust, but we know yeah, it's not going to be easy because when you're shifting power, 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 power does power not get back. Just yeah. like that. It fights back. Mm. It protects its position mm. and like that. So what it meant is, what are those are the mechanisms that the Beijing Platform from Action had to say? In these mechanisms, we have a quota system. We have affirmative action, and it's not saying that women are not are not qualified at all. In fact, they are. But because they are barriers, they are gatekeepers, they are people who will say we don't want women no matter what because they have been protecting um, these positions and these institutions and really making sure that women have no equal chance. Mm -hmm. So it's that okay. understanding of saying, you know, we are all not starting at the equal, it's an equal footing. Mm -hmm. So we have to create and we have to understand that for a rural woman um, where there's probably no enough road infrastructure, there's probably not much investment in terms even for them to access health. So we need to start shifting. So what you're saying, where you're saying, you know, the framing has to be everything that happens, even from a macro level and a level, is going to affect a right right every level for women to thrive and for women we have to interrogate how many schools are in a particular geographic areas what is the access what is the ratio what is the uh, um how is a young girl who is staying in a community where they are expected to first go get water to first you know do all these gender roles how is she able going to access education and compete at the same level with another boy? Mm -hmm. So just really breaking that down. And this is what, when, you know, when we say, I know there's also this thing, oh yeah, but we've had enough. You know, it's enough 25 years. We've been saying the same thing and we'll continue saying the same thing because if nothing is changing, no, no, no country has ever even achieved gender equality. Even the countries that we know have put in mechanisms for equality. Women are still not paid as much as men uh, across the board in most institutions. So 
you know, that is the kind of spirit where we are saying with Beijing, uh, 25 years, we are doing this generation equality to say the fight is still on. Yeah. We need to really start fighting these when we talk of these structural, systemic, deeply rooted things that are just normalized. Mm. But it's not normal when you are the one who are feeling the brunt of it. You know, if you are the one who have to, uh, you know, you know, you have to, even if you are working in an urban area, if you still have to go back, you've all been to work and you still go back into your private sphere and you're expected to do things which uh, the other agenda is not expected to do. You know, you're still being violated right at the core mm -hmm. and then you're expected mm -hmm. to perform at the same level. Really, if as long as those things were people are just not seen as equal, you know, you're seen yeah. because of your sex or being female or even if you're gender non you know, that's what they see. And because of that, they say, this is what you should be. This is what you should be. So that's what we're saying. We are pushing to saying, no, 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 no. And the generation equality is really trying to create that movement, that passion. That's just not about women working in the with women's rights organizations. It's not at all about that, but it's just about everyone just realizing to say, when you talk about issues of gender, it's not about, uh, it's just not a women's issue, but yeah. it's our issue yeah. because it's a justice issue. So those uh, six action coalitions, which are ending gender-based violence, um, economic justice and rights, um, uh, uh, climate, climate justice, and uh, technical and innovation, um, bodily autonomy, and feminist movement building. So those six are, are some of the critical action coalitions that we're saying, if we can, you know, you, you have to eat um, an elephant for one at a time. Bite. So, so FEMNET is part of the leading um, organizations within the Action Coalition working on economic justice and rights, um, which I think is really important to have an African women's rights organization in, at the core of that issue. Um, but as I was looking at who else is, <laughs> is part of the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights, it was really curious um, to see who else is on there. So in terms of countries, there's Germany, Mexico, Spain, Sweden, and South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of international organizations, uh, the OECD sits uh, in this action coalition. And I can't help mm -hmm. but think about the fight for tax justice and that Africa loses a minimum of $100 billion every year through um, illicit financial flows. And the global mm -hmm. governance system that is skewed against global south and regions like Africa, which means that the OECD is the mm -hmm. one you know, they come up with tax frameworks and regulation for the whole world, yet Africa doesn't mm -hmm. fit um, at, in those spaces of decision-making within the OECD. So I find that very interesting and how that power dynamic will play out. The other one that I find really interesting is the UN agency um, elected to yeah. sit within this action coalition is a new one uh, called the United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDS. And their tagline mm. is unlocking public and private finance for the poor. Now, mm. in a world where we're moving away from poverty reduction to working around inequalities and to, to fight inequalities, I find that very curious that they're still working around poverty reduction. But more importantly, with the centralization of private finance as a silver bullet for development on the continent. And we've seen all you know, the drama that comes with that, the debt that that ties African countries in, especially now with COVID and especially now that our countries are so cash strapped that we're taking as much um, debt as we possibly can. The question about who is going to be paying for it, um, what sort of contracts and on what basis are we signing these contracts on debt? But when you, mm. when you centralize private finance um, as the United Nations, I wonder what that means for us. And I wonder what that means for an action coalition working on you know, inequalities around economic justice and rights. Um, it's, it's, it's very curious for me how this will work out in terms of the power dynamics around that, in terms of different ideologies. Um, and I'm really curious mm. to hear what Feminit's perspective on that is and how you plan to navigate this? Yeah, so, wow. Well, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things around action coalitions was to also create um, a platform 
where we have private sector, we have UN, we have member states and we have civil society speaking to each other and really being able to assert and say, this is, these are the issues that we want you to deal with. And these are the issues and the critiques. So one thing that I do know was quite problematic with this framework is that it's coming from, it's coming from, from a premise where there's been what we call shrinking space for civil society to be engaging in multilateral processes. So it was how do we start breaking that? So with the Gender Equality Forum, it's a forum where we'll be coming together, uh, private sector, um, government, UN, OECD, all these um, entities with civil society. So we as civil society, as FEMNET also being part of this action coalition, is to be in the room and to also start challenging the same issues that you talked about. I mean, even with the Gates Foundation, we know they're the philanthropic fund, but it's to also really, you know, talk to them about, you know, these actions, this is how they harm us coming from the global mm -hmm. south, coming from Africa, the extractivist model of, um, you know, capitalization, that's not a model that we, we want to see. The need for transforming the global financial architecture, you know, having, you know, really lobbying and pushing for a tax justice system, you know, which is fair, which is transparent. So for us, our tactic is we want to be in the room to be able to sit across and to still maintain our position and not be absorbed or captured um, like, like what we know, but to be still in the room and still represent the views, the realities that we know women face. And because it's one thing to say, should we continuously be talking to each other within our movements? Nothing is shifting because we totally agree. We totally see we are also gathering the, the data, the evidence, which is already there, but to now put it across and say, can you, um, this is what we want you to be also telling the other donors. This is what we also mm -hmm. want you to be telling other UN entities. This is where we have a problem in your framing. Can you listen to us and can you take these actions? So what we are doing is we are coming up with a, with a position to say, from this action coalition, this is what we want. You know, uh, when you talk of illicit financial flows, we really want you to take action on illicit financial flows to consider the recommendations that are already, you know, that were already put forward uh, by the African Union um, mission. So those are the things that we as FEMNET, we are really positioned. And on economic justice as well, where we are really trying to push and move the narrative from uh, micro issues, but to really start looking at macro level issues as well. And to have that analysis where we can really start challenging and also asking for a shift in that. So we are well positioned, but of course, this is not something that we'll do alone. This is where we need a lot of uh, networks, collectives, activists, you know, specialists like you as well, who, you know, coming together, but also most importantly, also working with other entities like the media. Okay. Because we know the power that the media has in terms of driving perceptions and narratives, but also unpacking, you know, really unpacking, really simplifying and saying, this is what is happening. This is what we need to stop. And this is what we need to speak out. So, so and also advancing um, partnerships as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, FEMNET is leading um, collecting voices, um, priorities for for, for Africa and for Africa's women into the, the Action mm -hmm. Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights. Where do we find yeah. information? How do we engage? Just very quickly, um, as a you know, parting shot, how do we how do we make sure that whoever is watching this has an entry point to engaging with with this action coalition and can give input and can engage in this issue? Okay, so what we are also doing as FEMNET is we are we're having, um, now we can't call them public awareness <laughs> uh, Zoom meetings where we are reaching the different, because this is just for Africa, but we know uh, we have members in all the five regions of Africa. So we, we are actually in the process of creating a portal and a landing page 
around the action coalitions where on our website you know you can actually get more information so our website www.femnet.org is where you know if you can just write if you can just get in touch with us we uh, we've created what are called working groups where these are small working groups where we want to get the voices of african women what are the priorities and what are the targeted solutions so it's not so much about um you know constantly speaking the problem but mm -hmm. to say what are the targeted solutions if it's one thing to say we just want a un text body then that is the one thing that we want to push as femnet in the next five years if it's a uh, one thing around um institutionalized and you know a framework on gender transformative budgeting for all governments that's the one thing that we want to push so we are really trying to collect as many as views from the different regions, from different partnerships across uh, across the continent, and then come up with a paper where within that paper, you know, we can't go beyond four or five, yeah. because we know we can only achieve a few things. So that's the process. Mm -hmm. And we really want to invite as many people just to reach out to us and to really, really, um, you know, have a say in this, but to also uh, make demands on us as Femnet so that at least we want to play our role as well as facilitating um, the demands that are coming. That will really make a shift and a change in the next five years. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. This has been really interesting, insightful, and has really also for me, I've learned a lot, especially the historical background um, as to why it's so important. Um, I don't just remember the head wraps and, and like rebel Beijing women, but I now understand like why it's so important and what the journey has been. Um, just to end, I'll ask you to, you know, give us some insight into what's been keeping you up and moving in these corona times. Um, something African that has inspired you, has got you up and, and inspired to move or just like got you dancing or whatever it may be? Of course, dancing, Jerusalem has been the one, <laughs> seeing all the, all the moves happening. We yeah. tried it as family team, but I think we've been in lockdown for so long. We've gained so much weight, we can't even move our legs. Um, yeah, but I've just really been inspired um, with a lot. Um, I'm from Zim, and there was um, just a few weeks ago, last month, there was a whole Twitter on, on Zimbabwe Lives Matter. And for me, that really, I mean, just a solidarity from across Africa on just coming together and how even if people think Twitter doesn't change, even if people think social media, it is a voice. So that really inspired me to say, people can come from all over and we can really motivate, we can really mobilize when we see atrocities that's happening. I've also, you said three things, right? <laughs> okay, and then one thing that has also inspired me is, um, uh, Yasin Fo is a Senegalese economist, and I had a chat with her recently because, you know, Beijing was trying to create the voices so that we capture, you know, what was the vision of women? Twi I mean, tw imagine being alive and saying 25 years ago, this is what we're fighting. So just listening to those, they've been so incredible. I mean, I've talked to women who just make my... You know, I, I just start getting all these goosebumps to just see women who are in their 50s, in their 60s, in their 70s, who, to be honest, are pushing a feminist agenda unapologetically. So for me, that has really been inspiring. So I've spoken to Mata Karua, and, but I wanted to sing out loud and talk about Yasin for because she made a speech. Uh, to the World Bank, uh, to the World Bank governor then 25 years ago. And in that speech, you know, the stuff she talks about, it was really around structural adjustment. And she was just challenging and she, she was just saying, you need to first do the structural adjustment as the World Bank. And to be honest, what she talked about 25 years ago, way forward is still it's still relevant, it's still relevant. So that has inspired me. Yeah, and also just recently, um, there's a collective of feminist activists in Malawi 
who have just gone through a summer school and I'll be at their graduation. So just the honor of being invited in this, in their space of these amazing young, oh my goodness. You know, if there's one thing that really inspires me, it's just knowing that there's a movement that's out there. Yeah. You know, it's just a movement that is really, really doing things with whatever they have. Yeah, but I also have to mention that um, two weeks ago, I went to visit Edita, who is okay. also an activist, a women human rights defender, and they built, you know, with whatever resources they had, they built their feminist center for peace and justice wow. and rights. Wow. So I spent time with them. We went to Watsoka, uh, and it was just just amazing, <laughs> you know, just being with them and yeah. just being in their space, but just seeing the the amount of power that even if there's corona, even if there's discrimination, even if there's inequalities, that's not defining them. You know, that is absolutely not defining them. They're just still fighting. They are doing arrest within the community. You know, they are galvanizing resources. Um, oh, just amazing. Just creating safe spaces for girls. Put the links to all your inspirational spaces, people, initiatives, so that pe more people can, can see and can learn and can engage with them if they need to. Um, and I'll stop yeah. there because we could go on all day. Um, but really, thank you very much, Memory, for spending time with us and for allowing us to have a chat and to really pick your brain, your mind, your soul, your passions around this and for sharing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you.